have a great next session for you. We have Kristen Hawkins, the president of Students for Life. She works tirelessly as a mother, a wife, a pro-life activist, and the president of Students for Life. So it is truly an honor to hear from her. This session is going to be very important. She's talking about the history of the pro-life movement. These are things that you need to know to be successful in this movement. It's always good to have background and context of what you're talking about. So hopefully you guys learn a lot from this session and grow from it. And I'm sure we're all excited to hear her speak. So here's Kristen. Hey guys. Did everyone enjoy their Chick-fil-A? Everyone needs to write to Chick-fil-A corporate and say, hello, why do students have to pay for these Chick-fil-A sandwiches? Come to us for free. Um, okay, so I want to thank you all for taking the time to join me at this History of the Pro-Life Movement uh, presentation. Um, I've given this presentation quite a few times, usually in a closed room context without live streaming capability. So I've had to change it up a little bit. Um, but usually I give this talk to our leadership fellows, our Wilberforce fellows, our Stevens fellows, our Christian leadership fellows, because I feel like history is so important, especially when we're in the midst of such an important fight, because we have to understand where we came from to know where we're going. And there's a lot of things we learn from our history uh, to know how to form strategy, how to respond uh, to things that come up within the pro-life movement. So this is kind of going to be quick. I'll go through some legal history, and then I'm going to go through some pro-life movement history key um, milestones that I think you should know. This is not comprehensive. Uh, Jack Wilkie has the comprehensive book. Before he passed away, he completed uh, abortion in the pro-life movement. It was a complete history uh, up until the time of the pro-life movement. I highly recommend you check that book out. There's a lot of other books you could Amazon, you can Google about the history of the pro-life movement. Um, I do encourage you when you're reading about the pro-life movement and our history, where we came from, uh, to make sure you know who the author is because depending on who the author is will, depending on, will depend on a lot of what is said. So this is a short. This is, like I said, not comprehensive. Uh, a lot of the, this speech um, was written based off conversations I have had with staff. So people who were working within, within the pro-life movement in the 1970s, the 1980s, people who were working within the Ronald Reagan administration during that time. Um, so hopefully today, you, there's a couple of things that hopefully I impart upon you. We will have a Q&A session. Uh, so there's a microphone right there that you can get up and ask me later. Um, so let's see how quickly I can get through this. Um, and if you have questions, you can always um, tweet at me, Kristen Hawkins, or you know, comment in the live stream, and we'll get your information uh, and try to get back to you and you know, answer any questions you may have. Uh, and I apologize if I offend you at the beginning, okay? Does that take care of it later? So sorry. Uh, I'm always, I always offend at least one person when I give this talk. So I'm just really sorry at the beginning. Okay, so 1821, um, the state of Connecticut banned, um, is the first state to actually ban abortions after quickening. Uh, this was kind of uh, the legal definition for like fetal movement. Um, there wasn't really a set time, but it was just after the mom could feel fetal movement. Um, so that's 1821. That's, so that's before, I don't, know, does that, I don't know if anyone here follows history. That's before the Civil War, so that was a long time ago. 1873, the American Medical Association um, supported and something was passed called the Comstock Act, which banned the disinformation of information on birth control and abortion. Uh, interesting that the AMA actually supported the early bans on abortion. Uh, 1875, in a speech called Social Purity, suffragist and feminist Susan B. Anthony actually publicly spoke out against abortion. Other suffragists uh, openly opposed abortion. I speak a lot about this in my lies feminist tell tour about how the first wave feminists were actually pro-life. Uh, they were anti-abortion, anti-infanticide. Um, they actually saw abortion for what it is, an act of violence uh, against another human being, against a vulnerable, weaker human being. Um, all right, so 18, by 1890, 
Uh, abortion is regulated by statutes advocated, like I said, by the AMA. Uh, abortion is in most states permitted upon conferral of one or more physicians that who believe that abortion is necessary to preserve the life of the mother. In the 1920s, uh, it gave rise to the birth control movement. If you all have never checked it out, I highly encourage you to check out the documentary Maafa 21, M-A-A-F-A 21.com. Um, Maafa is a Swahili word for great tragedy. Uh, it talks about the rise of the birth control movement, the eugenics movement uh, within American history, uh, and you, that gives you a ton of information. You can even do a screening on your campus of Maafa 21. That probably will cause a little bit of controversy, so uh, make sure you tell us when it does, and we'll help you out for that. So 1920s gave rise to the birth control movement led by Margaret Sanger, who was a eugenics proponent and founder of Planned Parenthood. Uh, you know, as we know, Planned Parenthood is the nation's largest abortion vendor in the country. Um, how many of you have ever heard the word eugenics before? Yeah, see, this is such a smart crowd. Okay, so for people on the live stream who may not have heard it, eugenics is a study or the belief in the possibility of improving the qualities of the human species or the human population, especially by such means as discouraging reproduction by persons having genetic defects or presumed to have inheritable or undesirable traits or encouraging reproduction of persons presumed to have inheritable or desirable traits. So Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist. She believed that certain classes of human beings shouldn't be reproducing. That's why she believed in birth control. Just think about what that meant. So we have the rise of the Birth Control League, rise of Planned Parenthood. Uh, in 1961, um, Sherry Finkbein was a uh, child, local, you know, TV access, um, child TV show host in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, she publicly came out with a story. Her husband had gone to Europe, uh, had gotten some sleeping pills, purchased over-the-counter sleeping pills, uh, had come home to the States. She had taken 36 of these pills in the early stages of her fifth pregnancy. These pill pills contained the maldehyde, which um, we know cause fetal, severe fetal deformities. Often, uh, if mothers take this drug while pregnant, the children are born without limbs uh, or missing limbs or deformed limbs. She uh, came out publicly to tell her story uh, that she was going to have a therapeutic abortion, which most states allow at that time, a therapeutic abortion, meaning uh, abortion to preserve the life of the mother uh, or in case of fetal demise, if they thought the child uh, wasn't worth birthing. Just don't get me started on that. Um, she came out. Uh, the hospital came under a lot of pressure to not to commit the abortion, um, and they refused to commit the abortion. Uh, she ended up going to Sweden, her and her husband, and, re and received a legal abortion there in Sweden. Um, this was huge because it became Sherry Finkbein's story was a national news story. Uh, it was a story that the um, abortion movement, the early abortion movement, used uh, to human the uh, pro-abortion cause to advocate for a repeal of abortion laws in the United States. Um, if there's one thing you can learn uh, about the abortion movement, we saw this a couple years ago in Ireland, is um, what, they, what they have done is never, you know, the motto is never let a good tragedy go to waste. Uh, and they are very good at that in the pro-abortion movement of taking a tragic situation and using it to push something down uh, further down the court than they than previously was. So Sherry Finkbein's story is a national story in the early 60s. It starts the conversation in our country about when abortion should be legal. You know, should the, should the hospital have had the right uh, to say that they weren't going to commit the abortion? You know, shouldn't she have had the abortion? A bunch of Gallup polls were released saying, oh my gosh, Americans want abortion. This is outrageous. Um, in the in 65, an important Supreme Court case that you should take note of, uh, the Supreme Court invalidated a Connecticut law in Griswold v. Connecticut, which prevented the use of contraceptives for married couples. 
Uh, it was a seven to two vote. The Supreme Court found uh, in their ruling uh, that there was a right to marital privacy. This is very important because this case, while it dealt with contraceptives, is directly cited in Roe v. Wade. Uh, it was kind of the predecessory case to Roe v. Wade. So you have the Supreme Court case, you have Sherry Finkbein's um, tragic story. In the late 60s, an uh, abortionist named Bernard Nathanson, who was committing abortions there in New York State, which had already legalized abortion, uh, got together with a man named Larry Ladder. Larry Ladder was the biographer of Margaret Sanger. Um, he um, was the ED of the Hugh Moore Fund, which was a population um, control group. And essentially, their group believed that in the 1970s, there was going to be this huge population bomb in the United States. And there was going to be like mass starvation because there was just too many people on the planet, which didn't happen, by the way. Uh, but strangely, we still hear that argument on campuses. Have you ever heard that argument before? Yeah, we have a postcard students so I pick it up at our resource table. You can order for free. Like, just, I don't even engage that conversation. I'm like, myth debunked here. Take a postcard. Next. Um, so anyway, so he believed abortion was the solution to this impending population bomb. He actually had a falling out with Margaret Sanger later in life because uh, Margaret Sanger didn't actually advocate for abortion. She, she was a eugenicist who believed certain people shouldn't have the right to reproduce. Um, and she believed in contraceptive use, uh, preventing pregnancy, she said. Uh, but she said she didn't advocate for abortion. It's really quite fascinating. Um, so Larry Ladder, Bernard Nathanson get together. They form an organization called NARAL, the National National Association of Appeal of Abortion Laws. Today it's the National Association for Reproduction Action League or something like that. It's NARAL Pro-Choice America. It's still around today. NARAL was actually founded by two men, an abortionist and Martin, Margaret Sanger's biographer, who knew that they had to get the movement for abortion out of, at the time, the movement for abortion was in like this. It was pretty much like a rich, upper middle class, white guy type of thing. And abortion was seen as this eugenic tool. Once again, watch Ma'afa 21, watching on campus as a group, having an event, and talk about this. But they knew if they ever wanted to get abortion to be mainstream, and they wrote about this, and Bernard Nathanson, who later in life uh, becomes a pro-life activist uh, who stops committing abortions, uh, who actually becomes a Christian, um, he actually wrote in Aborting America how they... They knew that they had to get this abortion movement tied to the second wave of feminism that was just starting up in the 1960s. A woman named Betty Friedan is often credited with like launching the second wave of feminism with the feminist mystique. Well, the feminist mystique in the first edition didn't call for abortion. It was actually Ladder and Nathanson who met with Friedan. Ladder and Friedan knew each other for some, they uh, had attended some Marxist events in New York City together, had known each other from the same social circle. It was Ladder and Nathanson who actually went to Friedan and convinced her to, wait, hang on, two men convinced Betty Friedan that abortion was needed for the new women's rights movement. And that, my friends, is how the abortion movement gets linked into this new wave, the second wave of feminism. Is that crazy when you think about it? That's just absolutely crazy. Because you think about the beginning of feminism, the suffragists, and what feminism was all about, right? Feminism, the principles of feminism is that we are all created equal. We all have value, no matter who we are. That violence is always wrong. That no person should ever treat someone else like their property. Feminists are against oppression and violence. But yet that second wave of feminism then attached itself. And actually, Betty Friedan found an organization called NOW, National Organization for Women. They're still out there today. They're like a crippling organization. They, don't, they all fight Planned Parenthood now, and they row. It's kind of funny. Uh, they kind of beat each other out at the Supreme Court, and they get mad, and it's, 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 it's fun to watch. But anyway, so... At the 1968 meeting and now, and they're trying to come up with their guiding principles and charters, there was actually a vote called about adding abortion into their, like, 
platform for women, and it was a huge mistake. And actually, many people resigned, walked out of the vote. And it was actually here in Washington, D.C. area. There's a great book you should read. It's called Subverted by my friend Sue Ellen Browder. Sue Ellen was a writer for Cosmopolitan magazine in the 1960s. She was a part of the, you know, this new feminist movement. Uh, and she's actually come out and kind of documented how abortion got linked to the second wave of feminism. And I highly encourage you uh, to read that. Also, um, I give a talk on college campuses called The Lies Feminists Tell, which is kind of all about this. My friend Lila just put out a video this week, live action, put out a video this week, which is essentially like the nine-minute version of my 40-minute talk. So I encourage you to go to Live Action's page, find that video, and share it. We need to get the inform information out. We need to tell people what happened and how abortion got linked to the women's rights movement. Because we hear this all the time, right? How many times do you hear this on campuses, right? Abortion is a human right. Abortion is women's rights. For what woman? Surely not the woman in the womb. Okay, so you have the 1960s, lots of bad things happen. I mean, great music, fantastic music. I would say the 70s were probably better because that's when Led Zeppelin came around. But, you know, we can debate. I mean, the Beatles were revolutionary. But anyway, lots of bad things happened. We can thank our grandparents' generation for that. Also of note, Nathanson and Ladder are the men create, uh, who are responsible for that other problem you all often have on campuses. When people say, what? We can't make abortion illegal. If we make abortion illegal, tens of thousands of women will die of back alley abortions. Have you ever heard that one before? I want to start like just passing out cards. Be like, here's this card. Get educated and then we'll talk. Here you go. Here you go. Actually, I think we do have a card. Is what is road done. Um, we talk about this myth. This myth of women uh, dying from illegal abortions. In fact, in 1972... Uh, the year before Roe versus Wade, 39 women, the Center for Disease Control, not a pro-life source, by the way, the CDC reported that 39 women died from illegal abortions and 24 women had died from legal abortions. Planned Parenthood's own medical director in the early 60s, actually, Mary Calderon, had come out and said that the number of women dying from illegal abortions was around 250 a year, they thought, uh, and she credited the invention of penicillin uh, as to the reason why there weren't mass, you know, a lot of deaths because of illegal abortions. Because up till that point, until penicillin, the, the main cause of illegal abortion death was infection. Um, and so you didn't actually have this mass number of women. Uh, Planned Parenthood's medical director came out in the early 60s and said that 90% of the illegal abortions happening in the United States were actually being committed by physicians in good standing. They were family physicians, OBGYNs, who committed abortions but just didn't advertise it. Um, so this myth of 10,000 women dying a year from illegal abortions is just wrong. But yet we hear it over and over again. Nathanson and Ladder actually admitted to it that they falsified the statistics. So you can thank them for the, your talking to people to your blue in the face trying to correct the statistic. All right. So 1971, Comstock Act that I told you about in the 1800s is repealed. Abortion by 1971 is allowed under certain conditions in 14 states. Four states outright guarantee a woman uh, the right to choose to kill her child. In 1972, using Griswold, the Supreme Court issues another ruling extending the right to privacy to unmarried couples. January 22nd, 1973, the Supreme Court comes down with Roe and its companion case Doe, which together allow, and this is a huge point, when we look at polling, and you'll often, the, the abortion movement will say, seven in ten Americans agree with Roe versus Wade. Sure. Then ask them, that question again after you tell them what Roe versus Wade is. They don't actually tell you. Pollsters don't tell you what Roe versus Wade does. So we polled this week and we said, how do you feel about Roe versus Wade? We lost. Majority supported. Then we said, do you know Roe versus Wade allows for abortion all nine months for whatever reason? Then guess what happened? The majority opposed Roe versus Wade. It wasn't rocket science. This is what we do on campuses all the time. 
In fact, the number one thing, and I think this is a talking point for you and your own campuses, our pollsters actually came back to us and told us, uh, I have a line in the poll where I said, Roe versus Wade allows for abortion all nine months for any reason, even if the mother doesn't like, simply doesn't like the gender of the child. The, when, when respondents were actually taking our poll, they were stopping our pollster saying, this can't be right. This can't be right. They couldn't believe it that that's what abortion is actually allowed. You're allowed to choose abortion simply because you don't want to have a girl. I can't think of anything more anti-feminist than that. But All right, so Roe versus Wade comes down. Where is the pro-life movement? What's the pro-life movement? There really wasn't much of a pro-life movement in the 1970s. The USCCB, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, helped start the National Right to Life Committee. Um, they started as a secular organization, non-religious. A lot of evangelical churches were quiet. In fact, the Baptist press uh, came out praising Roe versus Wade. It was pretty scary. The 1970s can be kind of described as like this mobilization moment. People were trying to like understand what was happening in Roe. A lot of people were thought it was like this crazy thing that, of course, Congress will fix it. Nellie Gray, who was a, working for a Democratic congressman on Capitol Hill, is a Catholic. His outrage is going around to everybody, telling everybody in Washington, did you hear what the Supreme Court just did? And no one cares. So she didn't give up. She started the March for Life. They had the first March for Life in 1974. Nellie just passed away in 2012. Did you, I don't know if you guys realize this, but like the March for Life, no other social movement in the history of the world turns out more people every year than the pro-life movement. Isn't that crazy? That's nuts, right? 1976, 1978, Congress adopts the first and second Hyde Amendment. Hyde Amendment. You need to learn what this is. I know the problem was like, what, wonky, Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment prohibits federal Medicaid dollars, so money we give for people who can't afford health care. It prohibits our dollars from funding abortions. The Democratic National Committee in 2016 officially called for the repeal of the Hyde Amendment. This amendment has to be voted on every two years. It's, things are going to get very hairy. President Trump actually yesterday, while we were marching, issued a veto threat letter to Congress and told Nancy Pelosi if they try to strip out Hyde in anything, he will veto it. It was a huge accomplishment for the pro-life movement. In 1979, there's a Supreme Court case uh, where uh, the, the court found that uh, you know, a first trimester abortion didn't have to be performed in a, in a hospital. They said it was unconstitutional to force women to go to a hospital uh, to have an abortion. 1980, the Supreme Court upholds limits on funding abortion. They uphold the Hyde Amendment. Um, 1971. The Supreme Court, in another ruling, rules that pregnant minors can petition the court uh, to have an abortion without notification. That's called a judicial bypass. That's why in states, if it's a minor, Planned Parenthood often will drive the minor to a judge that's friendly to them. And they'll say, oh, you're an adult. You don't have to inform or notify your parents or get their permission. 1984, that former abortionist, Bernard Nathanson, the co-founder of NARAL, um, becomes pro-life. He films a video called The Silent Screen scream, which is an ultrasound, a 2D ultrasound image. I know it's hard for us to see 2D ultrasounds because we're like, where's the color? We need 3D. Um, but it, it shocks the conscience of our country because it's a 2D ultrasound of a live abortion actually happening. And I encourage you to check that out on YouTube. 1980s, we have Ronald Reagan is elected president. We have a pro-life House, a pro-life Senate. Everyone thinks they're going to end abortion. We're going to reverse, you know, everything that's happened. Dun, dun, dun. The pro-life movement fights with each other. <laughs> so there's the Human Life Bill and the Human Life Amendment. The goal is to ban abortions. 
and a split happens in Washington, D.C. Some people want the amendment. Some people want the bill. The amendment's kind of hard to pass. If you've ever learned about amendments, right, you have to get a big vote in Congress, and you got to get, you know, 38 states or 37 states to vote to approve an amendment. That's eventually what we'll do after we abolish and overturn Roe, so we won't go for a human life amendment. The pro-life movement actually splits on the strategy in Washington, D.C. Uh, the vote for the amendment fails by one vote. Vote, not because they didn't have the pro-lifers, but there were pro-lifers who were against the amendment strategy and wanted the bill. Why do I tell you this? Not to bum you out. I tell you this because this has happened multiple times in our movement. And this happens in every social movement, by the way. It's not unique to our movement. But I tell you this because when you become the leaders of the pro-life movement in your city, in your state, when you become the leaders of the pro-life movement in Washington, D.C., I need you to remember how you feel right now. When you want to bang your head against your notebook, because you have to remember this. We, we could have, we could have reversed 1973's decision. We could have ended legal abortion in the 1980s, but we failed. We failed as a pro-life movement. And it's a huge thing for us. I said that earlier today, no, no, not one single organization created the crisis of abortion, not one single organization is going to solve it. We have to work together. We have to work together as one movement. So you have a lot of stuff going on in Washington, D.C. A lot of people, notably, get mad at what happened in Washington, D.C. and are like, I'm stepping out of politics. Well, you had a huge group of evangelicals in the late 70s, uh, led by Jerry Falwell, the moral majority, who start to get active in politics. They start to pay attention. They're getting involved. Evangelicals are evangelicals understand what abortion is. They're mad. They're angry. They want to do something. They, they come to Washington. We fail with the human life bill and amendment vote. So we kind of go our own ways. Operation Rescue is founded. That is the movement that started doing the old school sit-ins in front of the abortion facilities. The first rescue was leave in 1988. I was three, so don't get me mad if it was 1987. I was three. Um, that first rescue was in Philadelphia. The rescue movement lasted for many years. A lot of other people, though, went to the pregnancy center, pregnancy resource center movement and started launching pregnancy resource centers. I don't know who started the first pregnancy resource center because I've met three different women who all claim to have started the first one, so I don't know and I don't want to mess it up. So it happened, I'm pretty sure, in the late 80s. Um, so you have the pregnancy resource center movement of let's resource women, let's help women, let's eliminate the reasons why women choose abortions. Um, so you have a lot of people getting involved in the movement. Uh, the rescue movement uh, pretty much kind of ceases to exist starting in you know, 1994. There was something called the FACE Act, which actually made it a federal crime to blockade in an abortion facility. There, it's, that's crazy. It's a federal crime to blockade the entrance of abortion facility. Just think about that. Like, do we have that for anything else? I've thought about challenging face. That would be kind of fun. A bunch of college students, like, what are you going to do? But whatever, you know, it's not time. Um, so we have face. So that kind of stops that movement of the old school sit-ins of stopping the abortions. Uh, and in Operation Rescue, a lot of people, you know, I think it gets a bad rap, but it was a 1960s protest tactic of, you know, sit in at the nuclear power plant, sit in here at the abortion facility and stop the abortion facility from opening up because if there's a bunch of people sitting there, no one can go and have the abortion that day. Uh, the most notable Supreme Court case you see in the 90s, starting in the 90s, uh, is 1992's Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which decided the constitutionality of several PA state regulations. The court reaffirmed Roe, which was bad. You never want the Supreme Court to reaffirm itself. But it held that state could pass some limits on abortion. Uh, they upheld a mandatory 24-hour waiting period, parental consent and notification laws. This case leads the way for incremental pro-life legislation throughout the 90s. Don't, don't, don't. Guess what? The pro-life movement fought again in the 1990s over pro-life incremental legislation. The object behind pro-life incremental legislation is let's find things that we know the court will allow us to ban. So the National Right to Life developed the partial birth abortion ban to ban the DNX abortions. And I don't have to describe the partial birth abortion ban. You should know it or you can Google it. Um, 
And we started passing that. Now, some people in pro-life movement don't like that and still don't like that. They say it's incremental and it doesn't ban all abortions and we should only fight for bans, uh, laws that ban all abortions. Um, and so that's a still an argument that's had in the pro-life movement today. But that bill gets traction, passes in a lot of states. It passes federally twice in the 1990s. President Bill Clinton, who said he wanted abortions to be safe, legal, and rare, vetoes the bill twice. Now, while the bill failed, and actually it doesn't get signed into law until 2003 when President Bush uh, signed it into law, what's interesting about, about the partial birth abortion ban is that it was probably one of those pivotal moments for the pro-life movement, that and ultrasounds. Because Americans, there was a four black and white box diagram that National Right to Life made depicting a partial birth abortion. Not graphic, not bloody, but showing the, the scissors going into the back of the skull of a baby. And that image was seared on Americans' minds. It was on C-SPAN. Legislators were talking about it. Every pro-life group was sending it out. It was one of the pivotal moments in our movement, I think, when you look at the polling numbers. Because if you look at the polling numbers of our movement in the early 1990s, we were getting our butts handed to us. But things started to change, and I think that was one of the main things. Because we showed the extremism of abortion. We showed the violent graphic reality of abortion. Also, ultrasounds. We all have seen our brothers and sisters in the womb. That argument of it's nothing but a blob of tissue really doesn't hold water unless you, like, deny science, which they still try to do. I met a bunch of them at the Supreme Court yesterday. They really hated that March for Life theme, by the way. It was hilarious. The Washington Post said, supposedly pro-science, and like, it was great. Um, unbelievable, unbelievable. Okay, so a lot of stuff happens in the 2000s. We get the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act finally gets in the law, the Born Alive Infant Protection Ban, um, it gets signed, the Unborn Victims of Violence Act gets signed, put into law. Uh, important date to note, 2006, Students for Life America finally launches full-time, yay! Um, 2007, 40 Days for Life goes full-time. I will be the first one to admit it. When David B. Wright told me they're launching 40 Days for Life full-time, I thought it was freaking crazy, and I said, I don't think it's ever going to work. Um, so that's how much I know about the success of 40 Days for Life. Um, Abby Johnson comes out, and, you know, leaves the Planned Parenthood, becomes a pro-life activist. Uh, Students for Life, then Lila Rose, then David Delight, and we have lots of undercover investigations. I think the most notable thing about, I'm going to leave 10 minutes for q and I think the most notable thing about the 2000s, as you need to know, is that for once we actually put the abortion industry on notice. Like, uh, we started gaining traction. We started attacking the Goliath, Planned Parenthood. We held the first uh, defund Planned Parenthood rally in spring of... I was pregnant and nauseous with Gunner. So spring of 2008, <laughs> I was having morning sickness. That's how I remember it very clearly. That was the first time we had a rally, a press conference to defund Planned Parenthood. If you think about it, really, from 2008 to now, what, now we're just started 2019, we've done a lot of damage to Planned Parenthood's brand in the past 10 years. I mean, it's incredible how much has happened. They have to be very scared, especially since we're like those, you know, like I said, we're the tortoise in the situation here. Uh, we're the slow moving, don't have a lot of money, may not have everything we need, but we keep at it. We kept at it. There's a lot of things that I can talk to you about in the pro-life movement, and I, I glanced over a lot of that happened in the 2000s because I want to leave time for questions. Um, things I think you need to know, things I hope you take away is pro-life division sucks. A house divided against itself cannot stand. We have to work together. And there's going to be a lot of opportunities that come up on your campus and your communities to work together with other pro-life organizations. And I hope you'll, you'll remember this moment. Um, also, I think it's funny to know seven men instituted abortion on demand in our country, not seven women. Uh, judges matter. When we talked, and you'll hear me a lot in election years saying, vote pro-life first, vote pro-life first. Heck, I started a new C4 organization, Students for Life Action. We're going to be talking about voting. Did you guys sign up and get your bullhorns, by the way? I made bullhorns. They're over there. Make sure you sign up. Um, but elections matter. One of the key things we know when we elect, like a president of the United States, when we elect senators, is they appoint and confirm judges. All those Supreme Court cases I just read are because of judges. 
We have a historic opportunity in our country and this historic opportunity coming up to redefine. We are redefining and reshaping our courts in this nation because of President Trump. Whether you love him or hate him, he has upheld his promise to appoint only pro-life Supreme Court judges. And we are truly lucky and there's a lot more that we can do. I think what's also cool when you think about the pro-life movement is this movement is 40-some years old, and it's going to continue to go, and we're going to keep fighting. And it's been, it's been an honor. There's so many incredible people who have sacrificed for this movement. And it's so hard when you have like 30 minutes to go over the entire history of a movement. I know I'm going to get people mad that I left something out. I'm, I know it's going to happen. But it's so incredible because the people who serve in our movement don't do it for the fame or the fortune <laughs> And when I think about the, the abolition of slavery in our country, you know, there's always those abolitionists you read in the history, you know, history books. There's like Harriet Tubman. There's like Frederick Douglass. There's like four. But you have to think about the tens of thousands of people who worked towards that moment. And you and I will probably never be in the history book when they say how we ended abortion. But we're going to be part of those abolitionists. That will be us. And so you can't do it for the fame. You can't do it for the fortune. Um, we have a huge opportunity in front of us this year, going forward in 2019, going forward in our movement. Planned Parenthood and the abortion lobby are scared. They're worried because you are here. They have something called the graying of the abortion industry. They literally don't have enough young leaders. They literally don't have enough young doctors committing abortions. But we have you. We can do this in our lifetime. So... I've given you a short history of the pro-life movement. I hope you've enjoyed it. I can give you a longer one in private one day. Uh, I have 10 minutes for questions. You can line up right here. Does anyone have any questions for me? Run. You're going from the one side. Um, did, when you were talking about eugenesis, uh -huh. um, did that, like, include sterilization and... Yes. Okay. That's yes. That's question. Mm -hmm. Eugen eugenesis, uh, they believed in contraception and sterilization. In fact, uh, many states had sterilization boards. The last state um, eugenics board was disbanded in 1980 in Oregon. The uh, state of Virginia actually just a couple years ago paid out large sums of money to African-American women who went in for surgeries in the 1950s and who were sterilized without their or their parents' knowledge. That's eugenics. Thank you. Um, my question is, so this movement is obviously, I'd say, majority Christian. I mean, you know, we're sure. having this meeting in a church. Um, but our society is becoming increasingly more secular. So mm -hmm. what do you think is a good, how do you think we should appeal to, um, sure. you know, atheists or agnostics Absolutely. about? Yeah, Students for Life of America is a secular organization. We hold our conference at a church because it's the best deal. And they're also very pro-life and friendly. Um, if you find me a hotel in Washington, D.C. that can fit all of us and can do this on the same budget, I'd be happy to host it there. So there's that. I always get that question. Like, why do you host that church? Um, that's the practical reality. Um, and the church is great. They're very nice. Um, I think that we are very lucky within our pro-life movement that we have so much diversity coming up. And we have, a, especially with Students for Life, like I don't think you can find a more diverse part of the movement than the Students for Life group. Um, and so there's a lot I think we can do. And one of the things we encourage Students for Life groups to do on campuses is to make sure your mission statement is a secular mission statement, your constitution is a secular constitution. And what I said today about staying on the dang road, stay on the dang road. Stay on focus, stay on your mission. I think there's this temptation within our movement. It's called the pro-choice distraction technique of saying, oh, well, you're pro-life, but you don't care about babies after they're born. You don't care about immigrants. You don't care about education. And then we're like, well, yeah, we do. Let's do about all this stuff. Well, you have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of money. You're called to this mission, this mission of abolishing abortion, because you know abortion is a fundamental human rights violation. Stay on this mission. If we want a diverse movement, a movement filled of people who have different religious beliefs, different beliefs on lots of really important issues in our day, I think we stay on a very narrow 
narrow focus of abolishing abortion. That way we can actually truly have a large tent, truly have a large coalition. Does that help? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, it's for short people, I guess. I was wondering if you could say a word about um, briefly the history of the pro-life movement internationally, and then also what are kind of key issues right now internationally. I, in particular, I was following what was going on in Argentina in this last year, and yeah. it seems like there are, we're at a pivotal moment not only here in the U.S., but um, around the world. And so yes, we actually are in pivotal movement. I don't have time to go through the history of the international pro-life movement. I would say this, though. Uh, they pay attention very closely to what we do here. If we end abortion here, and, and we focus a lot of students' life of how much time and money do we put internationally? Like, I love to go overseas and fight, but I choose to stay here because what happens here will have consequences around the globe. And what we've seen now is internationally, because the left took um, the case of the woman who died from, uh, from a pregnancy complication in Ireland, and they've used it to legalize abortion in Ireland. They've got this radical abortion law. You've seen the vote in Argentina, uh, in Chile. Um, they, they are doing everything they can to legalize uh, abortion in countries where previously abortion had been illegal. Um, and so we have to continue to fight here. Um, I think fighting here is the best thing we can do for our friends abroad um, because we give them hope. Uh, we give them the tactics and strategies that they can amend over there. So, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, when or how did you first become president of the Students for Life of America Association? And when will the next presidential election cycle be for the Students for Life of America? Next presidential election cycle? Oh. For my job or for President oh, Trump's job? Yeah, your job. My job? Yeah. I'm always looking for the next president of Students for Life of America. <laughs> Have you noticed I've got quite a few on staff that I'm training up for that. I became the president of Students for Life of America uh, in 2006, and I was hired by our board to be our first full-time employee. So I'm also a board member of our organization. So we have a full-time professional staff of more than 40 uh, adults working throughout the country. Is that helpful? Thank you. And I'm serious about that. I'm always looking for a replacement. So make sure you're a Wilberforce Fellow, Stevens Fellow. That's the best place I always look. Um, I have a question about the pro-life organizations not working together. We're from Ohio, mm -hmm. and the heartbeat bill has, yes. So for myself and my family, we feel like we support every pro-life thing mm -hmm. that there is. And, you know, I just can't understand that. And then you find that um, where does your loyalty go to? We just elected a pro-life governor who says he's going to veto this. And so anyway, just a comment on sure. where we should go with this, how to stand on it, and what to do. Well, I mean, I, I think we have an opportunity as students for life, as the next generation, to remember these history lessons in our past. That's why I chose to bring up this kind of depressing information today, because I wanted you to kind of feel depressed a little bit about it. Um, I think when we're talking about, I think you have to challenge the organizations to do better. Um, and what we try to do at Students for Life as much as we can is always try uh, to work with different groups. Um, and sometimes we just strategically don't have the time. We don't have the time or the finances to engage in the issue. Um, but the way we handle that is we're just not going to comment, you know. Or we might say, yeah, we support it, um, but we're not going to do much on it. And so because I always have to, you know, when you run an organization, you always have to make decisions, right? Like where are you going to spend your time and resources? It's, it's a constant prioritization battle. Um, and so I think it's about the way you approach it. And, yes, it's been sad to see what's happened there develop. Yes, next question. Yesterday, I believe someone said that there was the largest like amount of people that came to the March for yes. Life and everything. Do you think you could maybe ballpark a number for what that was? I would say a quarter of a million, 250,000. You can look at our time lapse. It definitely wasn't as big as it's been in other years because I remember one time I was sitting down at dinner at 5 o'clock and it was still going. Mm -hmm. uh, but it definitely was a lot larger than the thousands that all the mainstream media kept saying yesterday. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if there's any statisticians, anybody getting a statistics degree, um, you can take our time lapse and try to estimate that number for us. That would be great. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Linda, and I have a question about viable babies. 
that can be aborted up to nine months of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And there are doctors right here in Maryland who yes. abort the babies, yes. Dr. Carhart, Dr. who's Carhart. aborting uh -huh. up for any reason to nine months. So my question is, all right, with modern uh, ultrasound we have nowadays, 3D ultrasound that really shows a developing baby. Sure. I don't understand how our country could say this is legal to um, abort a viable baby that you could actually look sure. in the womb and see yes, this. Yes, I don't understand that either. That's why I do this work. <laughs> and see that a baby is growing. It's alive. Sure. It's not a glob of flesh. Sure. I mean, by any means, it's... Do you have a question? So my question Sorry, is... I'm like running out of time. They're okay, my question is how... How can our country justify that when it can be proved, such as like I don't know how our country can justify. That's why oh. I do what I do. It's an unjustifiable act. Um, I think largely most people just have no idea. People, when they are told about abortion, the vast majority, over 70% of Americans actually oppose abortions in the second and the third trimester. That is why the abortion industry is moving towards the chemical abortions, towards RU486, because they can get support in the first trimester. So I don't understand it either. I think they just don't know. Well, Dr. Bernard Nathanson, yes. who made that film, Silent Scream, mm -hmm. years ago, with outdated... Um, sonograms, ultrasounds, sure. showed a, an abortion taking yes. place and showed that that baby was struggling. Yes. So my question is, why couldn't we get another film like that? We to do, show and live action actually reproduced. I have to go to the next okay. question. Sure. But live action actually did reproduce basically the silent screams with another abortionist, Dr. Anthony Leventino, who we've been having speak on some college campuses. Um, so that would be something to watch as well. Last question, I'm sorry. And you can ask me later, sorry, sorry. So after Kavanaugh, how many like pro-life judges do we have in the Supreme Court and what do we need yeah. to do to get? The question, yeah, Kavanaugh. Um, we think we have a pro-life majority. We think we do. I would say, I have to be really careful because this is public. Uh, reversing Roe versus Wade is going to be a monster. It's a beast of the bill. The challenge we have with conservative judges tends to be this. They want to preserve the honor and the dignity of the court. Liberal judges don't care. They'll tear down the institution. Conservative judges, not the case. So the court doesn't like to reverse itself. The court hates to reverse itself because it passes, it's like admitting you're wrong, right? The court never wants to admit it's wrong because it hurts its prestige. So the challenge we're going to have, and I think this is with J Chief Justice Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh, who is close with Chief Justice Roberts, is while they're pro-life, they're not going to want to hurt the prestige of the court. What I believe we're going to have to have to overturn Roe is we need six and seven Supreme Court judges. We need it not to be a 5-4 decision. We need to be 7-2, 6-3. Does that make sense, everyone? That's why, like, you are going to hear me talking about the Supreme Court more and more and more. And this is why we've already started talking about because we believe before the... Be very soon, there could be at least one more Supreme Court opening. This is why the 2020 elections, presidential elections, there is going to be an all-out fight. If and when, well, when Justice Ginsburg leaves the Supreme Court, you will see a fight like you've never seen before. Where you were sick of seeing the Brent Kavanaugh coverage, that was nothing, nothing compared to what will happen when Justice Ginsburg leaves the Supreme Court. And I hope you all are ready because I'm going to be calling you to come to Washington, D.C. Thank you, guys. I've got to go talk to you soon.